Hi, everybody. Welcome to A Mighty Blaze. I'm Jenna Blum. I'm one of the co-founders of The Blaze, and I'm a New York Times bestselling author. In case you are new to The Blaze, again, welcome. We are a community of 30 creative volunteers who are dedicated to connecting writers with their readers in the age of COVID and beyond. And today, we are thrilled to welcome a writer who some of you may have heard of. His name is David Duchovny. His fourth novel, Truly Like Lightning, just dropped this week. Congratulations, David. Thank you. And welcome you. to The Blade. Thanks for having me. <laughs> We're thrilled. We stalked you, man. <laughs> and so I'm going to introduce my co-founder, Caroline, here, and then she's going to be talking with David. Caroline mm -hmm. Levitt, in addition to being the co-founder of The Blaze, is the author of 12 best-selling novels. So you guys are officially making me feel like a slacker because I only have <laughs> three. And Caroline's novels include Pictures of You, is it tomorrow? Cruel, beautiful world, which has the best cover ever, and with or without you, which came out last year, which is so fabulous. And it's not just me who thinks so. It was a Pop Sugar, People, Bustle, Publishers Weekly, and Good Morning America pick. Caroline's also a book critic for People and for the San Francisco Chronicle, so you should all be really nice to her if you're. <laughs> <laughs> she is a New York Foundation for the Arts fellow. And her essays have appeared everywhere, basically. So New York Magazine, Modern Love, which we love, um, and Bustle, and Lit Hub, The Millions, basically anywhere you ever want to read anything. Caroline is there. She's ubiquitous. <laughs> um, Caroline, my love, take it away. I'm going to disappear for a while, and I'll see you guys on the flip side. Enjoy. Okay. It. Thank you so much, Jenna. OK. So I want to say that David Duchovny is the definition of a Renaissance man. First, he's a brilliant actor. Who doesn't know, you know, the X-Files or Hank Moody in Californication? He's won three Golden Globes for both. He's acting in movies and plays. He's a singer-songwriter with three rock al albums. He plays concerts. And he's an accomplished best-selling novelist. He's published Holy Cow. Bucky fucking Dent and Miss Subways, which I was so thrilled to rave about for the San Francisco Chronicle. I just want to read you some of my rave for this. I call it a witty and profound showstopper about ancient myths, modern New York, and the persistence and magic of love. Read Miss Subways as a wonderful fam fantasy, an exquisite love story, or a Valentine to New York City. But you can also, like Emmer, look deeper. His newest book, Oops, let me get in front of the camera. Yeah. Truly Like Lightning is even better. I mean it. It's just, This book is just exhilarating. It's the story of Bronson Powers, a one-time Hollywood stuntman who discovers Mormonism and goes out in the desert to create his own specific brand of that religion and of the utopia and live with his three sister wives and his kids. But when an ambitious real estate agent wants his land, which is worth millions, she gives him kind of a Faustian bargain in exchange for not reporting him to the authorities. Put three of his kids into a public high school, into the world, and if they do not turn out better, which she believes they will and he believes they won't, she'll go away. But if they do become better, he has to give up his land to her and his utopia. I found this novel, whoops, <laughs> a stunning novel about ethics, belief, religion, mothers and sons, fathers and sons, and yes, Trump being a danger to us all, which I was really grateful to see that in the book, actually. So thank you, David, for being here so much. We're going to have, we're going to take audience questions at 4.30, but I get to ask the questions first. <laughs> okay, so. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to have your, you know, I remember that review. It was so, it was really wonderful to read. The and book I, was wonderful. I'm going to have it tattooed on my back. <laughs> Oh, good. Well, you can have it on your forehead. <laughs> All right. So the reason why I love this book so much is it does what the best novels do. It's not just this thrilling story that you just can't stop reading. It's got this incredible moral heart to it. It's about something, something deep, something that we care about. So I sort of know the answer to this because I researched it, mm -hmm. but I would like you to tell us the origin story of the novel, because I think writers are always sort of haunted into writing about something. What was haunting you, David? Well, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a really nice way to put it because it, it, I was uh, haunted over, over a span of probably 20 years. I, I, I had, 
um, written an X file in 2000, uh, and I took uh, this this guy named Mark Hoffman, who was a Mormon forger of Joseph Smith documents. And what he would do was uh, he he was just really good at it. He would write in Joseph Smith's hand, and he would write scandalous things, things that the uh, institutional Mormon Church would not approve of or would not want to be made public, knowing that they would buy these these relics from him and then suppress them. So he had this amazing lucrative business in religious forgeries and then the church just buying them up and destroying them or hiding them. Unbelievable. He, he ended up uh, actually uh, getting caught and actually bombing uh, a car bomb and killing someone. And, you know, it's a tragic story. But the idea of a forger who believes he becomes the person doing the forging, because when he would write, he said they weren't actually forgeries, that he would become Joseph Smith. And, you know, as an actor, this was fascinating to me, you know, th this idea that you become something that you're playing. So I was fascinated with the idea and I kind of wrote the sex file, but I, I didn't write about Mormonism. I created a character who was forging Jesus Christ kind of stuff and uh, Gnostic gospel kind of stuff. And the church, same way, would buy it to suppress it because he was writing about Jesus being very human and sleeping with Mary mm -hmm. and, and this kind of stuff. So I did a little research on Mormonism just because of that, and it was in my mind. And then I had studied with Harold Bloom decades before that in the, uh, the mid-'80s, and he had written, not that I studied Mormonism with him or Joseph Smith, but he had written in, the, in his book, The American Religion, that Joseph Smith was an American genius. And this was very surprising to me because that was not my conception of Mormonism. My conception right. of Mormonism was more like the Book of Mormon. you know. Right, right. So um, I was like, well, what's he, what's he up to there? Because Bloom was never wrong in my mind. Bloom was a, a, just a, you know, maybe he, he might have done wrong from time to time, but his mind was never wrong. Right. And um, I wanted to know what he meant by that. And then I, I got further into it and, and what I believe he meant by that and what really haunted me and inspired me to kind of bring all the strands of the story together ultimately was that Smith and Mormonism, that Smith was quintessentially American, that Mormonism is the only religion to have grown up on American soil, and that it, it is quintessentially American because it says explicitly where, where God, where, 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 man, where man is, God once was, and where God is, man may be. It's a religion in which men become gods, and women too. So it has this sense of American exceptionalism. It has this sense of that city on a hill and all this stuff that I was, I was watching in, in, in half horror, you know, during the whole MAGA stuff, make America great again. So it's like, where, what is the origins of this exceptionalism? And what is it about the American soil that breeds these people that feel the need to tell everybody that we are the best that have, that has ever been. And, there's something beautiful about it and there's something tragic and dangerous about it at the same time. Right. So that was the story I wanted to tell through Bronson Powers was a man who also, um, there is, there's a strain in, in Mormonism, which is just in the name. It's the, the church of Latter-day Saints. So this, mm -hmm. you know, and again, Bloom would say, you know, we're all belated. We're here in the 21st century. We've come too late to be original geniuses. Everything, has been said, everything has been done. All we can do is kind of put our own little gloss on it and be a footnote. But Joseph Smith says, no, we are saints, miracles are happening, Jesus came to America. Uh, we, this is the place and this is the time. And mm -hmm. that was so, for, for Bronson Powers, who was kind of an aging stuntman, maybe a drug problem, maybe mm -hmm. just feeling inauthentic, it was this notion of authenticity, of, of I'm in the right place at the right time. And that was very American too. There was no European ennui, you know, there was, there right. was nothing like that. It was, there was a youth to it. And I wanted to get at all those things. And that's kind of what circled around me and, and, and kind of created the, the plot and the story through which I could meditate on these things.
I also, you know, riffing off of that, I also wanted to talk about the whole notion of community, in particular religious community. My best friend growing up actually was a Mormon, and she was always taking me, a nice little Jewish girl, to mm -hmm. her church. And the thing that I found that I loved about going there wasn't the religion part, because I, I wasn't buying that, but I loved how warm and welcoming this whole community was, and they all supported each other, or at least that's what it seemed like to me. So I wanted to know, you know, the interesting thing was that Bronson had this community that he thought was utopia. And just as you said, it's beautiful and yet terrifying. These kids who he raised in this utopia did even better in the real world yeah. without giving anything away. Yeah. But they did even better because they had been taught these very specific things by their dad about question everything, yeah. you know, opening yourself up. So I wanted to ask you, like, do you feel the need yourself to have a community? And do you have a community? And do you feel like it's enough? Or do you feel like you're a loner and there's something to be said for being a loner? Uh, there's a lot in that question. So let me let me try and tackle it. I know, I do eight part questions, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, I think there are two parts to the community aspect of it. Let me say, no, I'm not part of a religious community or really any kind of community. And uh, I think I would like to be. Uh, on the other hand, I don't know if I'm a great community guy. You know, I, I, there might be a reason why I'm not in a community. I, I'm not sure. But I certainly long for brotherhood, I guess, for a community. Um, and I acknowledge that that's one of the great things that churches, synagogues, and, and, and mosques mm -hmm. do. You know, they 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 not, they not only create communities, but they service communities. You know, right. they do good works. Um, when I, when I think about Bronson's notion of community, because he just creates a community of his family, but mm -hmm. what he's got when he first discovers Mormonism, Christian Mormonism, it's a it's a part of Christianity. Is he feels like he's got access to a truth, and 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 that and that. Uh, is underneath all the the, dr the drastic uh, cultural changes that that happen over time. So, you know, socially we couldn't be further apart from what happened two thousand years ago, and yet there are these religious truths. If you are a believer, like Bronson is, that that mm -hmm. don't change. And I was um, I felt like the, instead of a community, uh, instead of a community that exists in the present time with with people that you see. Uh, he has a community that goes uh, horizontal, you know, goes back and right. Forth, right? right. So he he's in a community of of belief and believers, and what that gives to certain people, I believe, what what I think uh, I wanted that to give to Bronson was I was sitting here writing this book during, well, post just post Me Too, and then just kind of into Black Lives Matter, and I was watching these cultural upheavals, these social upheavals, these revolutions in culture and, and in perspective. And I saw how, how uh, unsettled everybody was. You know, people didn't know how to be. People didn't know how to relate all of a sudden, which I think are good things. But it was certainly, um, it was unsettling. And for certain people, people like Bronson, they want... Um, they want something solid that that is impervious to any kind of social change. They want the capital T truth. And if they believe they have it, then none of that stuff can affect them. None of that stuff can throw them off. So that that's kind of the consciousness that I was trying to write to because I was fascinated with it because I would love to know what the capital T truth is. I'm not sure that I have the type of heart or soul or mind that, can make that leap of faith, however, but mm -hmm. I, I am, I am amazed, uh, and and sometimes envious, and sometimes afraid of people who can. There's a great line in the book. Uh, I forget who says it, but it's any lazy mofo can believe in a reasonable God. <laughs> I love that line. Um, can you talk about that line? Like, what does it mean? What does it? What does that mean? Well, I mean, I, I mean, know I, what it means, but I, I want to hear I'm, you talk about it. I'm I'm half Jewish and half Episcopalian, I guess. So I'm I've got the Old Testament and I've got the New Testament. I'm coming at it both ways, um, and. The Old Testament God is—he's—he's um, he's tricky. He—he—he 
he, he's mercurial. He he makes wagers with uh, Satan uh, over Job. He wrestles with Jacob, I believe. He he does some nutty shit, and he's clearly uh, a person. He 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 may be God, but he has a a person's uh, un, uh, unexpected personality. He's got moods. Uh, he's not like that in the New Testament. In the New Testament, he he kind of takes a backseat to to Jesus, who 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 is God in the New Testament. So, um, I I was saying through Bronson, I guess something of my belief, which is Bronson, Bronson believes in that motherfucker of a God, that guy, that God, <laughs> that God who is all powerful but unpredictable, right? You know, and that's. In a way, um, if I'm going to sit back and, and look at nature and the world, the, the God of that image is more like is more true to the world that I've experienced in my life, which is capricious and and fate and and luck and timing and and not based on on rewarding uh, good works, good people, and all that stuff, but just like a storm. And you know, I look at the Sunday morning programs and the preachers saying, you know, pray for your, your success and all that. It'll come. And, and I just think, well, that's just too reasonable. I mean, that's, it's, it, that, that doesn't, that would not suffice for somebody like Bronson. Right. Um, I, one more question about spirituality and then we'll move on to other stuff. Um, partly why I love this book and why I felt it had such a deep part was because there was a spiritual underpinning in it. It's, it seems to me that it was asking the question about what is faith if it can't survive the outside world? And what is faith if everybody has to follow it and believe the same thing? And I thought that it really had to do with, you had in the acknowledgments where you acknowledge two people and you said, I hope you find, I hope that you are the miracles that you're looking for. <laughs> and I love that. I, I absolutely love that because I think that sort of straddles the duality of, you know, that faith, would you say that faith doesn't have to just be one thing? Because I don't think it does. Oh, did I say that? I don't know. I could have. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I think you did. Um, that, as you know, that's the amazing thing about writing is you, you're different people okay. on different days. And I'm like, did that guy say that? I guess, you know, if it's written down there, I okay. guess I said it at some point. But uh, to me, yes, that was the beauty of of Joseph Smith. It, it was the, the Latter-day Saints aspect of it, the, the idea that we are still in the time of miracles, you know, and that um, when I think of my children, um, you know, I want them to feel that magic, the possibility of it. Do I, do I know that it's true? I don't know that it's true. It's just, it's just faith really. But I believe that life is better if you can, if you can believe in, in, uh, not in miracles, but in, in, in the possibility of transformation and the possibility of faith and the possibility of miracles and the possibility of change and the possibility of love and all those things. So, um, I guess that's what I was getting at, because yeah, those two people that you're referring to are my kids in the front that I'm dedicating. Uh, to. I sort of thought so, but I didn't want. To. Yeah, yeah, those are my children. So, so let's talk about fathers and kids, because there's so much about that in in Michelle Calria, mm -hmm. in truly like lightning that I that I love, and there's a lot about mothers and kids too. Um, and I also read that you're going to be in a new film, Adam the First, which again is about a boy searching for the man who might be his <laughs> yeah. father. Okay, and also your son has done the music for an audible, audible <laughs> version of this book too. So that's that's a theme here. Yeah. The connection of fathers to their offspring. But yeah. Bronson's love for his son begins to twist towards the end into something that Bronson, I don't know how to say this while giving stuff away, that Bronson think is absolutely the right thing to do, but it's not so good. And in the end, it's the women or a woman who prevails. Can you talk about that, about the why these connections are so strong between parents and their kids and what it means to sacrifice literally and figuratively for your kids? Yeah. I'll try. It's very emotional. <laughs> I know. I think 
Yeah, I, I don't take it lightly. I mean, I wanted, I wanted to. I've always been fascinated with, um, well, as I said, with Job I mentioned earlier, but also with Abraham and Isaac, and, and and even beyond that, you know, Abraham and Isaac is but a is but a prefiguring of the relationship between God and Jesus in the New Testament That's because right. That's God, right. does, God does make the sacrifice of His Son. So we have, you know, two major strains in our two major. Judeo-Christian religions, which make up the most of this country, um, belief-wise, and and both of them arguably center around the possibility or the execution of, of the mur the murder of a, a son by a father. And I'm puzzled by this, and 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 moved, and 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 it's an area that draws me in because I'm like, what is this culture? What is what? We are founded on this. What are we saying to ourselves? What what does this mean? What is the fear at the heart of this? What is the pain? And um, I guess that's what I'm I'm looking at there too, because Bronson comes to a point at which I'll give some of it away. You're you're, you're being very oh, you can give it away. I just didn't want to do it. I know you don't want to. Yeah, but <laughs> but he gets to a point where if he is if he is consistent with his belief system. Um, he thinks his child might have done something uh, that is unforgivable aside from a kind of capital punishment, which is different from, from both the Abraham and Isaac stories and, and Jesus in the New Testament, but it is, it's on similar ground in that Bronson feels like to save his son's soul, he, he, might, he might have to uh, kill him, basically, and that He's not talking about saving his body. He's not talking about saving his life. He's talking his about soul. saving his soul, which is to a man like Bronson more important and to a certain religious person probably more important as well. And um, he's not a monster. He struggles, struggles mightily with this. He doesn't really know what to do, but he's walking up to the line. And he's true to his ideals. Yeah. You know, he remains true. Um, before we have to take audience questions, I, I've been dying to ask you this question. Um, it's about Pearl in the novel. She's one of the kids. There's a line of advice that's given to Pearl, and I want to relate it to you personally. Mm -hmm. Pearl is becoming an actress singer, and she's told, you love being up there on the stage because you think you're telling your story, and you're good at that. But the great ones, the really great ones, they do it to speak for those who can't speak. For them, it's not selfish. For them, it's a prayer for the powerless. I love it so much. I, I would want to tattoo that on my head. <laughs> Who do you personally want to reach? Who do you feel you speak for or you hope to speak for? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 I don't have anybody in mind, you know, uh, but I, I, I feel like I feel like I'm trying to to speak for some, some something or someone or or I'm trying to you know through a story trying to say something that is that I'm not hearing said enough or or, or that I want to hear said to me I guess I want to hear it said mm -hmm. to me and um, I don't know who it would be I mean as an actor I, I also that same guy you know Bartholomew in the book the acting teacher he he uh, recycles the old Salinger do it for the fat lady thing, right? <laughs> which, which, which is what I I love doing that. There are times when I've been acting, and if I have a certain amount of nerves, you know, because you can never know a day a day can just be a nervous day, and or, and usually it means that my attention is on myself, and and not and and that creates a self consciousness, which is not good. It mm -hmm. creates a tightness and. Uh, you know, I'll always like at that point, I'll just try to stay, take a step back and go, OK, I'm going to do this take for, you know, not the fat lady. I could say that, but or for, you know, this person or that person, I'm going to do it for somebody else. And just that gesture of service or or even close mm -hmm. to gratitude as a way of thanks to that person will take my selfish attention off myself, loosen me up. So it is a selfish move to show gratitude because I want to be a better actor. 
but that's kind of something that I'll try to do. So I, I guess, you know, all those things are kind of circling around when, when I'm thinking about acting or performance. I have my last question. I have to ask a writerly question. First of all, how the hell did you write four novels? Was it like four novels in six years? Or death, yeah. death to me, that's amazing. It takes me four years to write a novel. Yeah. Second, what kind of writer are you? Do you, do you plan things out? Are you disciplined? Mm. Uh, do you, um, how do you do it? Uh, what's your process like? Uh, well, I didn't write for a long, long time. So I have a, I have a bunch of ideas. So um, maybe that explains why I've, I've got four in, in, in six years. But the way I, I write fast, I mean, I, I, I have an idea of what I'm doing. I don't really have note cards. I might have like general general flow of story. But, and I don't know your process, but I find that the um, I, I can sit forever trying to figure out a story, but if I don't right. start writing it, 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 it figures itself out while I write, or it doesn't, but it's really once you get into those characters, once they right. start speaking, then the story will really change. For instance, I had no idea how I was gonna get, um, I, I, know, I, I knew that Bronson, the character that I created, would ne never let his children go to Rancho Cucamonga. And that was going to be the big, that was going to be the chasm in this book that was like a perceptive critic would go, yeah, it's good, but that's bullshit. And then when I was writing it, you know, and then Mary sees this burgeoning relationship uh, with Pearl and Bronson, I was like, oh, it's the mom. It's her. She's, she's the one that makes that happen. Bronson has no choice. She was such a great character. Just one more comment, and then I'm going to open it up to people. Um, I love the prose in this book. Um, I just found it was like it had such a driving rhythm to it. And I was wondering, is part of that your musicality? I mean, you play music. You're in a band. You're really talented. Yeah. People should go on YouTube and hear David. Um, do, the, do the things meld together? Does one influence the other? I think it's – I mean, for me, it's pretty rhythmical. Um, I, I just, I, it's not conscious, but I, I, I feel I'm pleased by sentences that, that kind of ha have a rhythm of some kind. I, I realize, you know, sometimes I'll get into too much of a rhythm and I'll realize I'll have to split it up. Um, I can tend to go for very long sentences. I can tend to like go for modifying clauses one after the other, after the other. And, um, you know, uh, sometimes I like a nice, just short Hemingway type sentence too. You know, it's just, it's it's really just a rhythmical thing, and I don't know if it's musical. It might be, um, but it's definitely r r rhythmical. Yeah, it feels it felt musical to me because it was driving me along. It was just, right. oh, it was just an experience to read it. Mm -hmm. I read that. I lied. I do have another question. I read that Sony is making a movie of this book, and not, you not, know, not, not Sony Showtime. Uh, Showtime. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, Showtime, that's right. Yeah. Gotta get that right. Yeah. Showtime, and you were gonna play Bronson. To me, that's incredibly interesting because as <laughs> you were writing this, no, 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 because as you're writing this book, you are the character, but you're also David the writer. How does that translate when you're acting and you're becoming Bronson? Do you have ideas where you're gonna, of how you're going to present him as a character that, that is different than on the page? Uh, well, it has to be different because, you know, there's a visual presentation. Oh, right, right, that's there, right. And there's, you know, the, the mental presentation, which is what a book is. So they're, they're, they're very different. And that's why I like to have uh, smart collaborators, writer, directors working with me who understand what we're trying to express visually as opposed to what I was expressing with words, you know, and, and it's, right. and what you have to do I mean, you have to let go a little bit and you have to go, okay, these are two different, two different modes and they take two different things and different things work in these two different modes. And you've just got to like open yourself up and, and let go a little bit of the book and just go, okay, we're in a new territory here. Let's figure this out. And, and to me, that's just as exciting because I wouldn't really want to have to be a slave to this book. You know, oh no. It's wouldn't want to just translate that guy. You know, I want right. to figure out how he comes to life 
Right. Yeah, I can't wait. I mean, that it just sounds amazing. So I want to thank you so much for answering all my questions. And now we're going to open it up to the audience. Oh, we've got something from Vicki Williams. When you're writing, do you add in any sneaky Easter eggs to link to any of your previous books, music, or acting roles? Uh, in general, I'm not a fan of the Easter egg uh, in any form. But <laughs> But I have, uh, in uh, Buggy Fucking Dent, I did refer to Miss Subway as one of the unpublished novels. But it wasn't a novel yet. It, it, was, it was actually an unpublished idea for me at that point. Oh. Um, uh, other than that, um, I don't think I have any Easter eggs. That's probably the, the one. Unless, I mean, you could call me out and, and let me know. But um, generally, I, I feel like that, you know that I'm trying to create a a, wor a, a world that's sealed, and and not one that's like bleeding out into into this everyday world. I, I, the experience I'm trying to create is is one a, a whole one in that world, and and I find that when you when you bring in these little clues or whatever Easter egg, right. I find that it's you know it might be fun, but it, it it kind of lets the air out of the bubble a little bit. I think. I think so too. It makes you see the writer. Instead yeah. of being in the world of the story. Yeah. Um, let's see. Fox Love, Diego Joni says, were there any particular inspirations for the women in Truly Like Lightning, like Maya and Mary, who were both great characters? Um, no, there weren't. Like, I didn't have anybody in mind that I knew. Um, I just, uh, they just kind of created themselves as I was doing it. I knew I, I needed Maya. I knew you know, gen her general outlines, but I didn't know what she was going to be like until I started writing it. And Mary, I mean, she became like this sword swallowing street performer out of the blue. <laughs> she was so great. I don't even know where that came from, you know? So that's what I mean when you're writing and it's like, Oh my God. Okay. Well that's happening now. All right. All right. And then, um, so, I mean, there was a, there was a, there's a stunt woman up in Canada that I've worked with a lot who's total badass, And I, I think maybe, Maybe I was thinking of her sometimes when I was writing Mary uh, physically, but um, I can't think of anybody else. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I love the cover of the book, says Frida Nielsen. Did you have any influence on that? So let me just show the cover again. Yeah. It is yeah. a beautiful cover. It's like yeah. lightning, cowboy, red sky. It's <laughs> yeah. fabulous. Yeah, um, I did. Yeah, I think I might have described it, and um, I don't think I chose the colors, which I love. Uh, and I did, I did do a little, like the one tricky little thing that I did was if you see, you see the cactus that's closest to the foreleg of the horse. I, yeah. I, made, I made him into a little cross. Oh yeah, so, so there there's, it is. There's an Easter egg. There it is. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Genius. Okay, next question. Which of your four books was the hardest to write, the easiest? I bet I know the answer to this. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I know the answer to it. I don't think I know the answer to that. Uh, Miss Subways was the hardest. Really? How come? Yeah. Um, because it, it, it had the least kind of uh, uh, recognizable shape, beginning, middle, and end. You know, it was kind of about... It was about uh, recurring things. It was about like circular uh, aspects. So right. it, it didn't have it. The ending was an opening rather than an ending. So um, I, I I found it difficult to write to a to an invisible end in a way. <laughs> uh, like 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 to propel it towards that was more difficult than like I know where I'm going with truly like lightning. Um, I think. Uh, Holy cow is probably easy to strike because I was just having fun and I, I didn't I didn't really have any stake in the game. You know, I was just like, OK, I'm going to see if I can write something long enough that might appear like a novel. Um, truly like lightning seems like it might have been hard to write, but it really wasn't. Uh, it was hard to, to crack the story and the story cracked with that moment that I, I spoke of earlier when I when I realized that Mary was the catalyst for the change. 
Yeah, yeah. I loved that. I didn't, ex I didn't expect that. And it's, it was one of those things where as soon as I saw it, I thought, this is exactly right. This is exactly what needs to happen. Well, that's what I was thinking when I was writing it. Because I was, I was getting to that point. I was dreading it. I was like, oh, here's the, this is the week. I mean, I don't know if you've had these experiences when you're writing, but you're like, yeah, you know, a good critic is gonna is gonna get is gonna like take me yeah. out here. It was surprise. It was you know you always want to be surprising and yet inevitable. And I yeah. thought you were. I yeah. mean, and also there was literally gasping at the end. Oh yeah. Because I felt, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, you took it to a whole other level. Right. <laughs> okay. Next question. How do you balance your time? You have about five careers from mm. Jenna Blum. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's just uh, I kind of uh, I'm lucky enough to be able to to just self generate some stuff and and uh, do what comes to mind. Uh, you know, aside from acting, which takes a bunch of other people and mm -hmm. a bunch of money to to do, uh, the other things that I do, uh, just writing, obviously, it's just myself, and music is just me and uh, my, the band. You know, three three or four other guys. Uh, that's pretty manageable. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really just when it comes to making movies, TV, that uh, managing time becomes a problem because when, when I'm doing those, then it's just all in 14 hours a day and that can get tough to do the other things at that time. Right, right. I wanted to also ask you another question if I can slide it in, yeah. which is, um, it, this has to do with the moral sense of the book. What I really loved about this book was also that there's a lot of there was a lot of rage against Trump. Um, I, we at the Blaze are definitely not Trump supporters. I wanted to ask you because it seemed to fit in with your novel's extraordinary finish. The terrorists who stormed our capital to do damage, knowing that they might die, seem to feel that their idea was worth dying for. Mm -hmm. This sounds like Bronson to me, but. And I think this was something that you said in the book, but just because you have an idea, is it really willing? Is it really worth dying for? I mean, do you think that willing to die for an idea makes that idea worth dying for? Hmm. Well, I asked that question. I don't think that, I don't know that I answer it. I mean, in some yeah, way, no, you don't. that's what's so fascinating. In some way, it's a tautology, right? Like if you mm -hmm. die for an idea, that makes it worth dying for. You did, you, you, you validated that idea in some way, at least to yourself. To yourself. Um, but, you know, when I look at the people uh, at the Capitol, you know, and I think of, you know, Trump bashing is easy and I don't do it lightly. I mean, it's fun to do and everything, but uh, I don't, I don't, it's not a knee jerk thing for me because what I was seeing, as I said earlier, what I was seeing with Make America Great Again was this, this recurring strain in American politics and the American character of exceptionalism and of greatness and this kind of um, greatness is my due, you know, exceptionalism right, that's is, right. is owed me because I am an American. And then there was something, you know, not in, in quite that way, but there was something in the idea of Latter-day Saints that was also this idea that we could be exceptional, that we are exceptional. And there was something heartbreaking in that to me. So underneath, like the the clownish aspect of, of, of Trump and 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 just the hideous person that he is, he he tapped in to to that. And 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 that's as I said, it's both a beautiful aspiration and a dangerous one. Mm -hmm. But it runs deep in us. It runs deep in our culture, in our in our country, in our society, and. Uh, you know, the more we can kind of face it and, and speak it out loud, the more we can kind of handle it, you know? I agree. Do we have another question? Oh, we do. Okay. Have you discovered anything new about yourself since you started writing and publishing novels? This is from Color by Numbers. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I have. It's hard. It, oddly, it, I think it's hard to put into words. Um, I think, I think, uh, I, I discovered a certain amount of pride uh, in, in being able to execute something from just a slim idea in my mind to mm -hmm. a big old book sitting on the table right here. And there's just, there's just that 
I realize that I have a, a real, I would say qu like a quiet pride in, in being able to uh, stick with something long enough to, to, to shape it and see its shape. And then that, mm -hmm. then, it, then it takes shape in the world, you know, and then it's sitting on my desk and then I'm like, Oh, that is actually satisfying to me. I have to ask you about, I mean, you obviously have nothing to prove to anybody. You're an award-winning actor. Your books do fantastic. You're successful. You're famous, whatever fame means to you. Do you read your reviews? I'll read my book reviews. Okay. I'll read my book reviews because they don't stay in my head quite the way an actor review would do. Although they don't really stay much anymore. I mean, they used to stay. But... Um, I think human nature, specifically my nature, is to um, remember things that give us pain way more than the things right. that give us pleasure. Right. So uh, it's it's a no-win situation because uh, you know if I read something positive, yeah, I'll get high for uh, a day, but <laughs> I'll, for, I'll forget it. And if I read something, I can remember negative things to this day. You know that are twenty-five years old. So <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Sarah DeVille had a question. Yes. What do you think is the key to great writing that keeps the reader up until 3 a.m. promising themselves just one more flat, one more chapter? <laughs> um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty old advice or an old uh, adage that um, it, if, if you're surprised when you're writing it, that the reader's going to be surprised. And, and I found with this book especially that I was constantly surprised by it. So um, I think, I mean, that's maybe that's just, that's not just a plot um, idea, but also just in the language and in the. Okay. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Oh, yes, we do. Last question. What are you working on now? I and mean, maybe we have a tiny tidbit of info about the movie you're shooting in London. Pretty please. I'm, uh, I just finished a short story that, that I think um, I'm going to put out on Amazon Audibles and try to do that I, I never never did that before i never wrote a short story and uh in london no nah, i can't i can't say anything but i'm leaving for london right now <laughs> oh well i want to i want to thank david company for being here this is his book whoops let me get it on the camera <laughs> truly like lightning it's extraordinary it's totally extraordinary um four or five stars. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank my co-founder, Jenna Blum, for being here. Mostly, we want to thank, thank you, you David. Thank you. Thank, thank you so, you. so much. I really appreciate, appreciate it. the opportunity and the conversation. David, thank you so much. Everybody buy Truly Like Lightning, buy at least five copies of it. Yes. Five more copies of it. And yes. we are your biggest fans here. So thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. For Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye.